welcome to Transformation of Late 19th Century America. This is Melinda Cole Klein. The United States became a modern nation between the 1860s and the 1910s. Vast reserves of coal, timber, and water helped fuel a growing industrial nation. Railroad lines crisscrossed the nation and knit together regional economies. Immigrants from Europe arrived at our shores because of America's rising standard of living, our high demand for labor, and the religious and political freedoms found in the USA. To raise money needed to purchase expensive equipment and machinery, coal and oil producers and railroad owners formed modern corporations. Businesses were owned by stockholders rather than individuals, which led to the growth of monopolies in America. New products gave Americans new ways to spend their money. Manufacturers of everything from toothpaste to enamel bathtubs advertise their goods to a mass market. In cities, department stores offered a dazzling array of goods. In the U.S., utility companies, railroads, department stores, and banks were privately owned. Some of the big businesses of this time were Bell Telephone, Boston Fruit Market, Marshall Fields Department Store, and the Kroger Grocery Business. With a growing population, both achieved through natural increase and the arrival of immigrants, the nation expanded. All the while, its residents and governments invested in the development of its infrastructure to include aspects of transportation. Andrew Carnegie specialized in mining and steel production. He poured money into new equipment and put his profits back into his company. As steel costs went down in the 1880s, his profits grew by the millions annually when his competitors failed. In addition, Carnegie acquired his own mines and thus produced his own raw materials and with lowered steel costs, there was a building boom. John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil became a leading power from the 1860s. By the 1870s, he bought up other oil refining companies, and in time, Standard Oil would control 90% of the nation's refining capacity. The first transcontinental railroad was finished in 1869, while four others were completed by the 1880s. Railroad pioneers such as Cornelius Vanderbilt made money due to the continued demand of a growing economy, advances in steel production and petroleum, along with westward expansion. This expansion of the American infrastructure when tied to transportation created jobs while it connected rural and urban markets with goods. Transcontinental transportation networks required natural resources such as coal, steel, and minerals to be mined and manufactured domestically or imported. For example, railroads used 20% of the nation's coal production. All the while, it created the need for repair shops for Midwestern industrial workers in Cleveland and Chicago to produce replacement parts. Out of railroad companies grew the corporation, a large organizational company. Corporations grew in size and power. State governments and the public watched as billionaire moguls created new monopolies with innovations in transportation, 
communication, and industry from the 1870s. Because of inexpensive steamship transportation from Europe to America and also Canada, millions of Europeans would make their new lives in North America. During this period, child labor peaked. In America by 1880, almost 182,000 children under the age of 16 worked in factories with no health or safety restrictions to protect them. During the last quarter of the 19th century, cash wages rose in American cities and the work week in 1860, which was 65 hours, dropped to 60 hours by 1900. Industry, and what I mean by this is manufacturing, rather than trade or finance, fueled urban expansion between the same time period, the 1870s to the 1900s. This resulted in cities of all sizes to grow and continue to expand. New York and Philadelphia doubled and then tripled their populations. Smaller cities, especially those in the industrial Midwest, such as Minneapolis and Duluth, experienced similar growth. But the most rapid growth of all was out west. Immigrants in America were typically hired as laborers, domestic servants, cooks, factory workers, and accepted lower wages than other urban residents. For this reason and others, racially and religiously motivated ones, Eastern Europeans and the Irish were particular targets for labor race related incidents at the workplace and in living in urban slum settlements. Immigrant labor built skyscrapers in Chicago, subways in New York City, and worked in steel mills of Pittsburgh. They sold vegetables on street corners. In all, they contributed to the national economy, or not, in a variety of ways. But two, there was unemployment among immigrants who resisted working in occupations and wages open to them. This included the sick, aged, unskilled, and alcoholic, who tended to resist learning to speak English in particular and resided in close-knit communities and not assimilating into the culture. The free enterprise system thrived on innovation new machines, new technology processes, new engineering feats, and new forms of factory organization fueled the growth and efficiency of U.S. businesses. Many devices that became staples of American life appeared during this period, such as the typewriter. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876. Of course, it wouldn't be popular and affordable until decades later. Thomas Edison developed the phonograph in 1877 and the electric light in 1879. Cash registers and stock ticket machines soon became indispensable tools for American businesses. Beginning in the 1880s, railroad cars installed steam heat and electric lights, boosting the comfort for their passengers. During this period, more and more businesses perfected the so-called American system of manufacturing, which dated back half a century and relied on mass production of interchangeable parts. Factory workers made large numbers of a particular part, each part exactly the same shape and size each time. This system enabled manufacturers to assemble products more cheaply and efficiently 
to repair products easily with new parts and to redesign products quickly. One example was the modern bicycle. It was produced cheaply using this system and resulted in a novelty craze due to its affordability, its transportation and recreational benefits as well. It enabled hundreds of thousands of commuters to bike to work. This was most popular in France, Britain and the United States. This would replace the need for paying to ride on a trolley or to ride on a train when traveling to and or from work. Oftentimes such workers were employed in low paying factory or urban retail shops in towns. Production techniques used to make bicycles were later adapted for the manufacture of automobiles. New technological processes also facilitated the manufacture and marketing of foods and other consumer products. Distributors developed pressure sealed cans. Unlike factory machinery, new agricultural machinery benefited consumers, but the need for hired hands quickly evaporated. Here's an example. Early in the 1800s, harvesting an acre of wheat took 56 hours of labor. In 1880, that number dropped to 20 hours. As with industrialization in England in the previous century, workers are always displaced with mass production of goods and technological innovations. After the War of 1812, the nation's maritime industry slowly recovered. While fossil fuels have been around since the ancient period, it would not be until the 1840s when a Scottish inventor was able to distill kerosene from petroleum. It would be this breakthrough that would lead to the decline in the demand for whale oil. Then, in 1853, petroleum was discovered regionally in Pennsylvania. As a lubricant crude oil, mechanics demanded this cheap whale oil substitute, and this followed true for hurricane lamps that would burn kerosene. In time, gas would be added to this list of whale oil substitutes demanded around the world. Kerosene was not only cheaper, but it burned brighter. Thankfully, by the 1850s, American sources were realized. Combined with the increased costs of whaling voyages and the dwindling number of whales, the discovery of petroleum is what America needed to push forward during the Industrial Revolution because it would be the availability of petroleum products that would offer a ready source of lubricants for the mechanized machines needed in manufacturing and transportation. This economic transformation affected many aspects of American life. It affected the demand for maritime labor, led to poverty, and contributed to the migration of families from the Northeast to the frontier or channeled them into factory jobs. Gone were the whaling heroes and the industry that fit well into the American ethos of hard work, sacrifice, and determination. Because of the volatility of steam engine technology, Americans and Europeans would develop new sources of power. In time, this became the fossil fuel powered engine and electricity, along with the use of battery power. Two technologies were critical to the development of the automobile. First was the creation of petrol or gasoline, a separation of crude oil from lubricating or fuel oil. 
Second was the development of a new type of engine. Thomas Edison believed the direction of powering the automobile should have been his idea in using batteries, an idea perfected and implemented in our modern age. In Germany, an engine that burned gasoline was in the development stages. A gasoline-powered four-stroke engine became the power source necessary for the industrial production and affordability of the personal automobile. In America, its popularity was phenomenal. In 1895, there were only four automobiles on American highways. By 1917, there were nearly five million. Inventions abounded in the 1870s. Most significant was the incandescent light bulb invented by Thomas Edison. An avid marketer of his own devices, Edison greatly influenced a higher standard of living that would be achieved by more people than in Europe. While not alone in these efforts, Edison created the first research and development lab in America. Not all of his inventions were original, as he employed other lab scientists and improved upon inventions by others. As an inventor, he kept busy with 1,097 U.S. patents. To this date, this is a record number of patents held by one person in U.S. history. A few of Edison's enduring inventions include the following. This would be the telegraph machine, the stock market ticker tape machine, sound recording and the phonograph, penny arcade movie-like shows with the kaleidoscope, and 35 millimeter film is still the same version invented by Edison. Important to his work with electric light was Edison's patent in 1880 on an electric distribution system. The wiring and circuit infrastructure needed to carry current. The first electric lit block in New York City was powered from the Pearl Street Station in 1882. With advance planning and public notices printed in newspapers on September 4, 1882, as promised, Edison lit up the financial district of New York City using his patented electrical power distribution system. This was in an area in Lower Manhattan. By 1883, the incandescent electric lighting system had become standardized in its application and distribution. While incomes by the 1880s rose during the industrial era, it was the middle class that had the buying power and surplus income. New white collar jobs did become specialized for men working as accountants, sales managers, and bankers. Doctors, lawyers, and insurance agents increased their profits and enjoyed new levels of prestige unknown to them prior to the 1870s. Rising incomes for the middle class allowed for additional spending on consumer goods. The all-in-one stores developed in France and England. This shopping trend quickly caught on in the United States with the creation of Woolworths, Sears and Roebuck, Marshall Fields, and Montgomery Wards. Large cities built shopping districts in New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia, with chain stores opening in San Francisco, Denver, and Dallas. Public transportation sped middle-class shoppers from the nearby suburbs to downtown offices and stores. 
One such innovation in urban transportation was the streetcar. The combination of disposable income, transportation, and a mass market consumption by the middle class of commercial goods transformed women's daily lives. Canned goods freed them from shopping daily for food, while the cooking, cleaning, washing, housework, and early childhood management and education was left to domestic servants and nannies. But the range of women's roles was limited to her household and serving in a charitable capacity to her community. While office jobs were opening up to women by the 1880s in the United States and abroad with the advent in business practices with the typewriter, professional jobs for educated middle-class women were generally limited to teaching and nursing. By the 1890s, more middle-class women entered the workforce as women began graduating from universities and staying single longer or not marrying at all. To newly moneyed sectors of American society, life involved protocols that dictated expected behaviors. Standards established in Western Europe, especially Britain, became most important to the rising number of families that wished to form political and economic alliances with important families in Europe. Between the 1890s and the 1910s, this was quite a trend among wealthy Americans to marry their daughters into the gentry and aristocratic families of Europe. Some sources claim about 100 American heiresses married in such fashion. Daughters of wealthy American industrialists, financiers, and bankers who married into the nobility of Europe brought wealth to ailing noble families and cemented long-term relationships. Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny Jerome, was such an American. This trend was called a time of the dollar princesses, or titled Americans. There have been a few books published on American women who, for better or worse, married men for the sake of their family. Industrial capitalism affected time away from work. Leisure activities for the wealthy, middle class, working class, and the poor varied in their preferences and practices. Factors tied to leisure activities were age-old issues of time and money. By the 1880s, baseball and football were already popular team sports with college and city teams playing for the public. American baseball was founded from English cricket. Baseball appealed to working-class factory males. Like in England, rugby, along with competitive rowing events and horse competitions, required a monetary investment and sufficient skill. In America, features of expensive sports did develop. As it was played in colleges, football, the counterpart of the rugby game, became a national sport. For centuries, boxing had been popular among the working class and the poor in general. Drinking in pubs resulted in fights, and it all went hand in hand. Boxing required little equipment or league association. Thus, this sport the poor could enjoy without limits. Plus, it became interesting to observers, rich and poor, as it was customary, though illegal, to bet on boxing matches, especially ones in the late 19th century. In time, boxing became a more respectable sport as the result of training and the establishment of rules and judges. 
This would make boxing more appealing to a broader cross-section of spectators. Other forms of public entertainment developed in cities in response to industrial workers with a few dollars to spend, and it took different patterns. Cheap music halls with drinking and dancing became widely popular in poor neighborhoods and slums. Secondly, there would be early movie theaters in the 1890s, first appeared in working class neighborhoods as short serial film experiences, showing to crowds different films throughout the day for low prices. This attraction was for those looking for cheap entertainment. The working class and the poor could not in mass enjoy movie pictures until the 1920s with soundless film shows. A Nickelodeon was an establishment with film reels that could be seen by viewing them from a film box device after paying a few pennies. These establishments are similar to modern day arcades with a variety of cheap games that may be used as forms of entertainment. Movies with sound were not to be invented until 1927. After then and throughout the 1930s, it became a glamour time in regards to the movie industry. This is when going to the movies became enjoyed and funded by wealthy patrons. For middle class Americans and elite Americans with a little bit more money, vaudeville entertainment and musical plays and operas were frequented by those in society in places like Carnegie Hall. For reasons tied to politics and business, it was a necessary feature of middle class life to be perceived as conforming to the standards of Victorian morality. These leisure activities were seasonal and they also included summertime travel, formal dinner parties, and attending events such as a socialite coming out party. The most popular form of public entertainment was that of Coney Island in New York City. This was an amusement park and a resort on a popular beach in Brooklyn. There were rides, arcades, gardens, and exotic adventures such as experiencing a burning building or earthquake. There were boardwalks to enjoy the view and time with family and friends or a date on an outing that was inexpensive. Coney Island was enjoyed by both rich and poor.